Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we give you all praise. We come now asking that you will help us as we deal with this most important subject of intercession. I pray for my mind, Father, to help me to think your thoughts and my mouth to speak your words. And then help us all to hear as your spirit speaks to us this day. In Jesus' name we pray, and the church said amen. On last uh, Sunday, I started this sermonic series on intercession, on interceding. Today I want to talk about why intercession must be first. If you want a definition for the word intercession or intercede, it means to pray on behalf of someone else to stand in the gap. The ideal of intercession is that there are people who are lost and who are blind and because of their activity, because of their lifestyle, they are inching closer and closer to the wrath of God being poured out upon them. In the book of Genesis, God comes down to Abraham, Abram, and he, he makes this statement, shall I, shall I reveal to Abraham what I am about to do? And he says, I know that Abraham is a just man and he will, he will keep his household right. Shall I reveal to him what I am about to do when I leave his presence? And then he says to Abraham, now listen to this. Because of the cry of Sodom, and Gomorrah, because of the wickedness, I am being told that their wickedness is grave, and now I am come down to see for myself, in so many words, if what is being said by, about Sodom and Gomorrah is actually true, and if not, then I will know. And here, here goes... Here goes Abraham, and this is, this is why intercession is so important. He said, Lord, if there are 50 in the city that are righteous, will you spare the city for the 50 that are righteous? And then he says this, he says, it's not right for the righteous to perish with the wicked. He says, will you spare, will you spare the city for the 50 that are there that are righteous? And God says, I will. And Abraham goes on and he gets him down to 10 and he says, for the ten, for the ten, if there's ten in the city, will you spare the city for the ten? And God says, I will. Now, Abram stopped at ten. But I believe if he would have gotten down to one and he would have asked God to spare the city for the one, 
God's response would have been, I'll spare it for the one. Now, the point is, because of the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah, they brought about upon themselves the judgment of God. And it takes someone to intercede to stay or to stop the judgment of God and give the city a little more time. That's what intercession is all about when it comes to you as an interceder for other people. Whether you know it or, or not, our wickedness, our acts of wickedness, come before God, and then God has to deal with it. And if there is someone who is interceding on your behalf, then God will stay or not bring about his judgment upon your life. Listen, you don't want to fall into the hands of an angry God. You, you want to be spared from that. We all do. Amen. Certain things that we do, God is angry about. And yet, his anger is stayed as long as there is someone who is interceding on behalf of the guilty. Listen, we're not innocent and... and, and and we need to understand that. And yet, God will spare us from judgment when there is an intercessor praying. Say amen. Now, this is why it's important that we intercede for others. Because no one wants people to die and be destined to eternal damnation. We pray and we ask for a little bit more time. We ask that the presence of God would be brought into their lives so that they might make the right decision. Does everybody understand that? And, and it is uniquely, now listen to me, it is uniquely our responsibility, those who have been born again, those who are citizens of the kingdom of God, it is our responsibility to be intercessors for a lost and dying world. Say amen. In, in Matthew chapter 12, you can mark this down, verse 26, and it is repeated in Luke's gospel, verse 18. In those passages, Jesus teaches us that Satan, now listen to me, when we deal with intercession, we deal with an enemy. Satan has a kingdom. Jesus said, if Satan is divided against himself, how then can his kingdom stand? Uh, Satan has a kingdom. Jesus said, I come to uh, destroy the works of the devil, his kingdom. In Colossians, now listen to this, chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, and please, please write these down. The Apostle Paul echoes Jesus' statement when he says, now listen, always thanking the Father, for he has enabled us to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. Now, when he means we live in the light, he means we live in truth. 
And then he says, for he has rescued us, listen, from the kingdom of darkness, Satan's kingdom, and has transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, this is what I want you to grab a hold of today. Whether we understand it or not, when it comes to this truth, there are really only two kingdoms that exist in the realm of the spirit, in the, in the spirit world. Now, I know there's a lot of different kingdoms in the natural. Uh, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the kingdom of Kuwait, and all these other different places, those are physical, earthly kingdoms. But above all those kingdoms, there are only two different kingdoms. There is the kingdom of God's Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and then there is the kingdom of Satan, listen to me carefully, who is Lord of all those who are of the world, whether they know it or not. Now, did y'all hear what I just said? There's only two kingdoms in the realm of the spirit, in the spirit world. The kingdom of God's Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, or the kingdom of Satan, who is Lord, who is Lord who is Lord of all those who are of the world, whether they know it or not. You are in one kingdom or the other. There is no neutrality. There is no sitting on the fence. In Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, listen, Paul teaches we all, we all, let me say this again. We all, say we all. At one time, we all at one time, whether we want to understand it or not, we all at one time walked according to the prince of the power of the air who is Satan. And his nature or his spirit was at work in us, how do we know? Because it produced lustful desires of the flesh and of the mind. My mind was on the wrong stuff. I did what I felt I wanted to do. And because of this, because we at one time we're all children of Satan. Now, I know that's hard to believe, but I want you to understand what God says is true. And, and, and please understand this to, to some degree. And as you continue to get older, you continue to manifest the works of Satan. The works of your father, lying, stealing, cheating, messing around, doing stuff, being disobedient. All those begin to grow in us as we get older. Say amen, somebody. We were by nature sons of Satan or daughters of Satan, however you want to say it, because in us was produced lustful desires of the flesh and of the mind. And because of this, we were children, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, fit for the wrath of God. God would have been just to bring about his wrath because of our wickedness. Now listen to this. Yet in Ephesians 2, verse 4, it says, but God. Say amen. amen. Now, he paints a bleak picture. He says, and you who were one time, you were alienated from the life of God. You walked in the darkness that Satan has cast upon the hearts and the minds of people. And you were by nature 
children fit for wrath. And then he says, but God. Thank God for but God. And what he's getting ready to do is share with us that God has intervened on our behalf and changed our future. Say amen. He says, but God, who is rich in mercy, say amen. Well, let me, let me just share this with you. Mercy is not grace. Mercy is different from grace. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. So here's what God does. You deserve eternal damnation, but I'm going to extend mercy, amen, so that you don't have to experience what you actually deserve. And so God, who is what? Rich in mercy. I, I read in Lamentations that his mercy, his mercy is renewed, what? Every day. So God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, God commended his love towards us while we were what? Yet sinners. Christ died for us. Say amen. Has made us, has made us alive together with Christ. And then he says, by grace are you saved. Well, thank God. Say thank God for grace. Now let me help you. Every last one of us received Jesus. Because somebody, y'all better hear what I'm saying. Because somebody interceded for us. We, we do not have the ability without there being first intercession to receive Jesus as Lord. I know you thought you did it on your own, but I got news for you. Somebody was praying for you. And somebody was praying for me. You'll never know who until you get to glory. But I promise you, somebody was thinking about you. If God didn't put it consciously on their mind, God had them praying in tongues for you. Say amen. And so we don't get to stand up and say, because of me, I got, I got this. No, no, no. There were people who were involved in your transformation process that you have no idea of. Say amen. So every last one of us are products of somebody else's what? Intercession. All of us, say all of us, had to be prayed for. To get into the kingdom of God. I know I'm right. What I want us to know today. Listen, Satan ain't trying to let nobody go free. Do y'all hear me? You are born into, into sick, sin, sin and wickedness. You are born blind. And the last thing Satan wants to do is to lose you out of his kingdom. What I want us to know today, please listen, is that the salvation of the lost will not happen until intercession is first made on their behalf. You mean to tell me that I have to pray in order for the lost to receive salvation? The answer is absolutely yes. Now, please hear me. This is, this is I'm getting ready to get into it deep. So then why must intercession first be made on behalf of those who are lost? Listen, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, 
Paul tells us it is God's will, listen, that all men, say all, be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. It's God's will that everybody be saved. Yet for God's will to manifest, here's the key, in the world of men who are being controlled by Satan, we who have been delivered out of Satan's kingdom. Y'all getting this? Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, who has delivered us from the power of darkness or the kingdom of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. We who have been delivered out of Satan's kingdom because of the intercession of others. We who are in the world, but not of the world. Y'all, we can't, listen to me. We got to get this statement. We are what? In the world, but we are not what? Listen, listen. We are to be transformed in our thinking and our behavior. We are not to be like the world. We who are in the world, but not of the world. John 17, verse 14 and verse 16 must pray for God's will to be done in the realm or the in the world of men as it is being done in the in the heavens if you don't pray folk don't get saved we must intercede for the lost first Everybody say first. The intercession for the lost must first be made before they can ever be delivered out of Satan's kingdom. They are in Satan's kingdom. Why? Why? Because according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Verses 3 and 4. This is powerful. Listen. The revelation of the availability of the kingdom from the heavens where Jesus is Lord is being hid from men's eyes. Satan According to 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 4, verse 4, has blinded, say blinded, the eyes. Well, let, me, let, me, let me just read this passage because you, you need to see this. So, so if people are blinded, in order for them to see what must happen, the blindfold must be removed. How does that happen? How does the blindfold get removed? Through intercession. Do y'all get this? Listen, in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan's is blinding the spiritual eyes of those who are lost. Are y'all hearing me? Until the blindfold is removed, a man cannot, say cannot, he cannot receive Jesus as Lord. Now, I'm going to say this, and this is going to mess you up. Satan has no problem with you being a part of a local congregation as long as that congregation doesn't teach you kingdom. 
as long as that congregation is all about other than truth. You can be a part of whatever church you want to be a part of. And if that church is not teaching you the truth, then you have not changed. Are y'all listening to me? Satan has blinded the lost to the truth that there is another kingdom that is available to whosoever will. It is through, listen, submitting one's self to the lordship of Jesus that we escape Satan's kingdom. You have to bow your knee to Jesus. Did y'all hear me? And the scripture says every knee shall what? Well, you have a chance to do it willingly now. But you will never bow your knee to Jesus until somebody first takes the blinders off your eyes. Why would anyone not want to be a part of God's kingdom? The reason is because they think that there is joy in living apart from God, doing their own thing. Do y'all hear me? And listen to me. Don't say that there is no pleasure associated with sin. Because sin is all about pleasing the flesh. But don't you know there is an eternal consequence that is associated with you pursuing your flesh? Say amen. Lord, help us today. Satan, say Satan. He is the blinder. He's blinded the lost from the truth that God's kingdom is available to them and all they have to do is bow their knee to the lordship of Jesus. And listen to this, that we can escape Satan's kingdom or dominion over our lives and are placed back, this is good, into God's kingdom. Now listen to this. And how do you know when you're really in God's kingdom? where there is righteous living. Did y'all hear me? Where there is peace. Did y'all hear me? Where there is joy and true power being manifested in our lives on a daily basis. You mean to tell me we ought to be experiencing righteous living, the peace of God which passes all understanding, joy unspeakable, full of glory, and the power of the Holy Spirit alive and active in our lives on a daily basis. Yes! Being a part of a church doesn't provide this. But when you move out of the mindset of this thing called church, into God's kingdom where Jesus is really Lord of your life. That's when change begins to happen. Do y'all hear me? There's so much hell in the church. Why? Because people can come in the church and never change. People join churches because of all kinds of reasons. My friend go to that church, and so I'm going to go to that church. Oh, I like the social programs that's connected to that church. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Nobody, nobody can know whether or not you've been born again from the inside out. That's between you and God. That's why Jesus said there are tares and there are wheat. But listen to me, he also said, you'll know them by their fruit. Listen, 
Some people are a part of the church to hinder it. And they are, they are, they are being used by Satan. Are you listening to me? Because all they are about is self and self-grandizement. I'm there to get what I can out of it. Some people become a part of the church because they think that's the happening thing. If you are not a part of the church where you have made Jesus Lord of your life, and are in constant, I said what? I said constant pursuit of the change that is manifested in you submitting to his will. The, the biggest issue we got is our will. And, and, and listen to me, when you say Jesus is Lord what you're saying is not my will, but his will be done in my life. As you grow and study and study and grow in the word, it is not just for you to get fat off of. Paul talks about a group of people who are Forever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. What, what is he saying? He's saying all they want is to be taught something, but they don't understand the truth of it is what you are taught will do you no good unless you apply it to your own personal life. Somebody ought to say amen behind that. And because the world is blind and are blinded by Satan, we must first intercede for those who are lost and don't know the truth that it is God's will that they become a part of his kingdom. I, I hope you, you guys get this. Everybody turn to Isaiah 25. Verse 7, I want you to listen to me carefully. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this as clear as I can, and then I want to hurry up and be done. Through intercession, say intercession, we pull the veil of blindness off the spiritual eyes of those who are lost. Now, you, 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 you think I'm just saying something. I said turn to Isaiah 25, verse 7 and 8. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully. When, when God created, are y'all listening? When God created Adam and Eve, they had the ability to see not only physically, but they had the ability to see in the realm or the world of the spirit. Did y'all hear what I just said? In other words, their eyesight was not only physical, but it was what? Spiritual. Now listen to me carefully. You can go to the river and you can get some water and look at it and you don't see anything in it. But if you take a telescope, are y'all listening? And put that water underneath that, excuse me, microscope. Put that water underneath that microscope, then you are able to see all that little stuff crawling around in there. How many of y'all understand that? Can you see it with your naked eye? No. We get a telescope, and we are able to see far beyond what the naked eye allows us to see. How many of y'all understand that? How many of y'all understand that? Okay. 
when God first created Adam and Eve, they saw not only the natural world, but they saw everything that was around them in the spirit world. Now, listen to me carefully. I, wa I want you to grab hold of this. The prophet, the prophet Elijah, not the J, but the huh, the second one. Now, listen to me. He had a servant. What was his servant's name? Gehazi, right? Now, listen to me carefully. He was being, they were being pursued. And they went into a mountainous region. The prophet Elijah, Elijah and his servant, Gehazi, they went into this mountainous region. And they were being told that, that the armies are coming after you. And, and the prophet wasn't worried at all. And, and the prophet's uh, uh, disciple was absolutely afraid. And, 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 and the prophet got tired of the, 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 the disciple walking in fear. And this is what he said. The prophet said, Lord, open his eyes. Did y'all hear what I just said? Well, he was looking, wasn't he? But, but there is another eyesight that wasn't open, but the prophet could see. But the man, the disciple, couldn't. And then the, the prophet said, Lord, open his eyes. And when his eyes were open, now listen to this, all around the mountain were angels with swords of fire. An army, listen to this, a spiritual army that was gathered all around the prophet protecting the man of God and whoever was walking with him. Now, listen, listen to me. They were already there. It's just that the man couldn't see it. When did the blindness happen? See, the blindness or the veil was pulled over the natural eye so that it could no longer see in the spirit. It happened at the fall of Adam. And here what God is saying is when he restores the new heaven and the new earth, the thing that will be removed from us is the veil of darkness that has been pulled over our eye. Listen to me. Listen. We live with that condition. Why? Why do we have to walk by what? And not by what? We walk by faith because God is doing stuff that we cannot see in the world of the Spirit. But we need to know that when we petition God, it begins to move angels from one place to another to cause what we are believing for to come to pass in our life. If you could see it, you wouldn't need faith for it. But until the veil is being is removed from our eyes, you have to walk by what? Faith. How many of y'all understand that? And so don't think when you pray ain't nothing happening. When you pray, it's a whole lot of stuff that begins to happen. And things take what? Time. But if you if you if you look at it from the natural, you won't see. Uh, do y'all understand? Here in, in, in Isaiah 25, verse 7 and 8, it talks about the removal of the veil. Well, the veil is designed to keep us in darkness. That veil was pulled over our eyes when Adam sinned and transgressed against God. But that veil will eventually be removed. Say amen. 
and we will be able to see God. And we'll be able to see the angels, the angelic host. Say amen. How do we see it now? Through vision, through dreams. But one day that will be over with. Say amen. If the lost, now listen to me carefully, could see into the lake of fire, Y'all hearing what I'm saying? If we could look right now and see in the realm of the Spirit those who are in eternal torment, do you think we would try to act right? You think you do right? I, th I think we would say, you know what, I don't want that. But we have to go based on word of mouth right now. This is why... I'm getting way off, but please just stay with me. This is why in the new heaven and the new earth, you will be able to see those tormented souls who are in the lake of fire, and there will never be the, 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 the desire to transgress against the commandments of God. Why? Because you can see everything. Everything is exposed to you. Right? Say amen. Right now, people think they're going to die and that's it. Or, even more foolish, they think when they die and go to hell, there's going to be a party down there. Why? Because all my friends are in hell. See, that's the foolishness that people teach. Uh, are y'all hearing me? You know, going down to hell, building air conditioning and all that kind of silly stuff. That's a place of torment, y'all. In order for the lost who are on their way to eternal damnation to change, we have got to intercede so that we can pull down the blindness so that they can make a decision for Jesus. Somebody say amen. Uh, go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and then I'm done. Verses 1, 3, and 4. If you don't intercede, you will never give those who are lost the capability of changing, of making a decision for Jesus as Lord. Listen to what Timothy says, or Paul says, I exhort therefore, I urge you, I encourage you, that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercession, everybody line, circle the word, what in your Bible, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, say all men. Now, then he, he goes into kings and all those who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. But listen to me carefully. I want you to get this. You got folks you know who are living contrary to God's will. And I don't care if they say I'm a Christian. Listen, God knows those who are his. And it is manifested in their lives. Some folk, some folk that, you, you, that say they, they are a Christian, that's exactly what they are, a Christian, and they're not born again, and they are not a part of God's kingdom. Somebody told them all you got to do is this, and they did that, and now they think they're something that they're not, that they have no fruit or evidence of. Because remember, being a part of God's kingdom produces joy, peace, righteous living, and power in your life. Are y'all hearing me? I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplication, prayer, and intercession, giving the thanks be made for all men, for this is good, verse 3, and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of what? The truth. 
They cannot be saved from their blindness until the veil is removed and it takes what? Intercession. Intercession must first be made by those who have escaped. Can I, can I make this clear to y'all? A lot of the movies that we see really are mimicking this truth. Y'all ever saw The Matrix? You know what The Matrix is all about? It, it's a movie that's really all about, about the blindness that is over the eyes of people and then those who have been free going back in and freeing those who are blind. That is our responsibility as God's people to pray, intercede for those loved ones. And listen to me. I'm talking specifics. Stop this, Lord, I pray for the whole world to be saved. Did that work? No. No, that's never worked. But you can pray for Judy, and you can pray f for, for Mike or Bob or Pookie or whoever that person is. You can get their name on your list. And listen to me. Before you ever approach them, you better spend time interceding for them because Satan is not trying to let them go. And until you break Satan's power over their life through intercession. Are y'all? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? This takes what? And God will tell you when. Trust him. God will tell you when to make the appeal. But before you ever try to make an appeal, you better do some what? You better intercede for them specifically. And don't be telling folk, I'm praying for you, and you ain't said a word. Did y'all hear me? Trying to pawn yourself off of as some spiritual individual. Stop that. Pray for people in secret. And God who <laughs> sees and hears in secret will reward you what? Openly. Listen to me carefully. This is why we must become intercessors and why intercession must first be made for those who are blind to the truth. Close your Bible. Say amen, would you? I pray that some of you all who have become hopeless towards some individuals ever-changing, I hope you now see the error that we have committed, which is that we have not first interceded on their behalf. I want you to stand to your feet this morning.